Acts chapter number 26, I'm going to begin right into this story. The Apostle Paul has been arrested for being a Christian, for his faith. I heard somebody say one time, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So here's Paul, and he's before King Agrippa, and he gives King Agrippa his background, and then he gives him his testimony. You know, a testimony is a powerful thing. We need to use our testimony. Tuesday night when we started the summit, I had him show the video for the 100 trillionth time of Billy Kelly when he got saved. And some of you are here and some of you saw that. It's a tremendous testimony. So don't be, don't be hesitant to use your testimony with people. Tell them, tell them what the Lord has done for you. Amen? God's done great things for us. So in verse number 12, he begins, he says, Whereunto, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. That's a bright light. Shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Aren't you glad your sins are forgiven? And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning does make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost, almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God, not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Father, we just praise you today, love you, worship you, adore you. Lord, I pray that you will bless this message. I pray you speak to us, God. Lord, we want to hear you speak. Lord, we want to hear you in our hearts. And we need you, God. We need you today. We're thankful for the summit, Lord, but the summit's over and this is a new day. And we need you to bless us today. I pray for anybody in this room that might be lost, that they would be saved today. And I pray, God, for we, the Christians here, Lord, that we would be filled with the fullness of God. And we ask you this in Jesus' 
precious name, the name above every name. Amen. I want to preach this morning on the subject, it's great to be a Christian. It's great to be a Christian. Greatest thing ever happened to me, I got saved. And my wife got saved, right about the same time. And our life has never been the, chance, the same. I was going to say it's never been the change, but it's never been the same. You can't get saved and stay the same. You can't do it. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I thank God for, for that day when we trusted Christ and put our faith in the Lord. And I thank God that he changed our lives and all things are new. Old things have passed away. Now, I want to preach about that idea about being a Christian. What is a Christian? A Christian is a born-again believer. A Christian is a saved person. There are not born-again Christians and regular Christians. There's not saved Christians and other kinds of Christians. The only Christians that are Christians are saved people. So I hope you have been saved. I hope you have been born again. Over in the book of Luke, chapter number 18, and I preached out of this last couple of weeks, the Lord said, the Bible says in verse 9, talking about the Lord Jesus, he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Now a parable is an earthly story that teaches a heavenly truth. So there was a moral to this story. This is a parable. And he spoke it to people that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I would guess, and it's a pretty educated guess, most people in this world believe that if they are good enough, they'll make it to heaven. If they can just live a good life, if they can be a good person, if they can be a good husband, a good dad, good wife, they go to church, maybe they help some people, and what they're really trusting in is their own selves, their own righteousness. And the Bible says this, by grace are you saved. That's getting what you don't deserve. By grace are you saved through faith, by faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God. And then it says this, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could work your way to heaven, heaven would be the proudest place in the world. Everybody would be up there bragging about what they did to get to heaven. Boy, you think you did something great. You should hear what I did. I am the greatest. It's not like that at all. Nobody gets to heaven because of what we do. If anybody gets to heaven, it's because of what God did. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at Matthew chapter 7 with me. Matthew chapter number 7. And in verse 21, the Lord Jesus said this. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just because people talk the talk doesn't mean they're a Christian. Just because somebody talks about the Lord doesn't mean they're saved. You've got to have a real experience with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, not a few, not some, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Haven't we done all these things? And then will I profess unto them, look at this, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What a shock. Listen, these are people that really believe they're Christians. They believe that they, they, have, a, they have a head knowledge of the Lord. They know, you know, they, they would not say, oh, I'm an atheist. They wouldn't say, oh, I don't believe in God. They, they believe in God with their mind, intellectually. And they, they, they may believe all the stories in the Bible, but they've never trusted Christ as their Savior. 
And they're trusting these things that they did to get them to heaven. And guess what? What we do isn't going to get us to heaven. It's not going to get anybody to heaven. I was talking to my son Mike last night about a man who's a very good man, very honorable man. And uh, he, he, he talked to Mike about putting a rung in his ladder. And there's people that actually believe that every time you do a good deed, it puts another rung in your ladder and you just get closer and closer and closer to heaven. Well, guess what? All those rungs are rotten. And all those rungs are going to break and you're not going to get to heaven by good works. So I just want to say that up front so nobody is confused and sits here and thinks, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. If you're not saved, listen, you need to get saved. Amen. You need to get born again. You need to call on the Lord. Ask God to have mercy on your soul and get saved. Amen. So I want to talk a little bit, a very short message on why I love being a Christian. It's great to be a Christian. I love being a Christian. I love everything about being a Christian. Amen. I love it all. Amen. You name it, I love it. John chapter 10 and verse 9, the Lord Jesus said, I am the door. The door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief, that's the devil. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more what? Abundantly. Listen, don't let anybody fool you. The greatest life in the world is the Christian life. I've had people say to me, well, you know, I just, I, I get saved, but I, I just couldn't live it. Well, I'll tell you what, if you can live lost, you can live saved. Amen. The Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. The way of transgressors is hard. Did you ever say to somebody, how you doing? They say, living the dream. And they say it sarcastically. Living the dream. I get, can I look, look at me? I'm living the dream. I've been living the dream since 1975. And it's a dream come true. And it's the greatest life in the world. And we don't have anything to complain about. We don't have anything to criticize about. We don't have anything to moan about, groan about. God's good. God's good all the time. And it's great to be saved. Went to a funeral on Friday. Bobby Huttenlock, his, his dad, passed away. And uh, Bobby has the plumbing company that his dad started. And uh, a lot of the trucks were there in the, in the church, in the parking lot. And here's the name of the company. Best Choice Plumbing. I thought, man, that's a good name for a plumbing com company. But guess what? That's a good choice for a person to be saved and to be a Christian. The best choice. You can't make a better choice than choose Christ and become a Christian when you choose Christ. 19, probably 1982, I had a, we, we I had a boy I used to pick up on my bus route. He grew up, his dad, Mr. Pons, was such a blessing to me and my family in this church. Back in the day, he's been in heaven for a long time. But his son got in trouble. They had a shooting over there in Lindenwall, and uh, they killed somebody, and they were going to kill him. And he called me on the phone. He was just about hysterical. He said, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. You got to come get me. And I thought, man, I, just, I really don't want to come get you, but, you know. And uh, so we had a 75 station wagon, a yellow Chevy station wagon. And uh, I pulled up there in the apartments, and I got out, and I opened the passenger side door. And I come in, I told him, on, this was the old landlines. I said, you be ready when I get there. And I come swinging around that court, and I came around slow with the door open. He come running out of that house, and he dove in the car, and we took off. Sent him down to Texas, and he went to school down there, Brother Rolops in the home, uh, lighthouse home, and he was graduating. So 1982... I'm going down for the graduation. Get the cheap ticket. We fly from Philadelphia to Indianapolis. Now, if you know anything about geography, Indianapolis is not on the way to Texas. So I get up into Indianapolis and sitting on the plane. And uh, last person on the plane. I'm sitting there. I got nobody on the seat next to me. I got room to stretch out. Last guy gets on a plane, just makes it, just runs on a plane. Runs next to me, sits down. He gives me his name and says, I'm Ron. Blah, blah, blah. He said, I build uh, malls in Texas. And uh, I just got out of the pits. I was in the pit. It was the Memorial Day weekend. He said, I was in there with A.J. Foyt. And uh, I'm going back to Texas. He says, and, and what do you do? It's like, wow. 
You know, you know, I only met you like a minute ago. I know your whole history. <laughs> had, a, had a Bob Gibson personality, Heather. I said, uh, I'm a preacher. And he looked at me. He said, you're a preacher. He said, you can't drink. You can't smoke. You can't go to movies. You can't dance. I don't like that. I'm like thinking, wow. There's a guy like dropped out of heaven on my lap. <laughs> And the Lord gave me this thought. I said, it's not that I can't do that stuff. I just don't want to. And when I said that, it was like somebody hit him with a brick. He said, I have a friend of mine, and all he keeps talking to me about is being saved. Every time I see him, all he talks to me about is being saved, being saved. He said, what is this being saved? And I talked to him about it, and he prayed right there on the phone, on the, on the, on the plane. And when we got to Houston, Texas, he said, I'm going right to the phone, and I'm going to call him, I'm going to tell him I got saved. About two weeks later, I was home, and he sent me a check in the mail. Now, you know he got saved. <laughs> Seriously, it wasn't the money, but that check was real reassuring to me. And I don't know where that fellow is, but uh, he got the real thing. But here was the deal, listen. Here's why I was telling that story. I almost forgot why I was telling the story. All he saw was the negative side. All he sees was, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. How about you can, you can, you can, you can? I mean, the benefits sure outweigh anything else. And you know, all the stuff you can't do or shouldn't do, God don't want you doing. It's not good for you anyway. So number one, I'm just glad. I love being a Christian. But think about this. Being a Christian has so many advantages, so many benefits. When you're a Christian, you know God. You know God. If you're sitting here today and you're saved, just the fact that you, you know God, you have a relationship with the God that made the heavens and the earth. I did a funeral yesterday, or no, I did, a, yes, yesterday I did a funeral. And uh, people were sitting there and the and, uh, room was filled with people. And I, I said this in the beginning of the funeral, I said, listen, if, if, if you don't have God, you need to find God. And I'm going to tell you how you can find God. But it's a heartache to me. It's, it's just a heartache. It just breaks my heart to think about all the people that don't have God. They don't, they don't have the Lord. They don't, they don't know God. I, I know why I'm here. Brother Charlie said to me last night, we were over at his house eating. He said, well, why are we here? He was talking about the church and getting people saved, soul saved, life changed. Well, why are you here? You know, there's a whole lot of people in this world are looking for something that's worth living for. Just a reason for their existence. Like, what am I doing? What am I, you know, it's, 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 it, 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 it's all, like Solomon said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It, it, I'll tell you what we're here for. We're here to glorify the Lord. And life is all about God. And God has a purpose for your life. You're not just here. Let me say this, I'm thankful for a Christian, that I'm a Christian, because I get to see God work. I get to see God. You know, a lot of people just miss God. They just miss God. I was up this morning early, got up before daylight, and it's just a quiet time, and uh, you know, the birds start singing just before daylight, and you know, you got the stars out at night, and you got, and, and just... But just to see God doing something in your life. We were here in the, in the summit this week. And, and God just filled this place with God. I mean, it was, just, it was just awesome this week. And some of you know that. But we get to see God work. And uh, in Psalm 126, it says, uh, The Lord hath done great things for us. We're, uh, we're glad. Now think about your life. Think about where you were. Think about wh where you are. Think about what God's done for you. Yeah, there's hard times. Yeah, there's sickness. Yeah, there's all kinds. Of, but God's done great things. If, if, God, if you're just saved, I mean, just saved, nothing else. You're, you, God's done great things for you. It's just a wonderful thing to be a Christian. I was sitting here in the front row. I guess it was Wednesday night. And uh, I, just, I just started thinking about what God has done in our church. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about when Mrs. Clark and I left Texas would come back to New Jersey. We rented a, 
a truck. We rented one of those Roger trucks, one of the big yellow trucks. And I think Brian Wooner sent us the money because for us back then, that was a, that was a month's pay. And uh, I remember we loaded that truck up. We finished our work right up to the last minute. And I remember circling the farm. Brother Roloff, my preacher, was out back of his house in the garden. He was bent over, and he kind of stooped, and he looked up, and he waved to us. Took that truck, turned out the gate, made a right, and headed for New Jersey. Had Brother Charlie sitting in the truck. 14 years old. My wife was, I guess she was 33. I was 35 back then. Headed home. Back to start. Solid Rock Baptist Church. We got out of the farm about 12.30. 7 o'clock the next morning, we're on Route 10, chugging along in that truck. I said to my wife, I, I just got to take a nap. We're going down the road here about 10 miles. A big sign says, Bain and Minette, Alabama. Just make a left-hand turn. So I went to sleep there in the truck. I woke up at 7.30, 30 minutes later. It said, Florida Welcome Center. And that's okay, but you don't go through Florida to get to New Jersey. So we turned around, went back, got back to New Jersey, and started the church. I remember first morning, we, we, we got back in June, and we, we finally found a place, we rented a place. God, God was in all that, I could tell for hours about that. But it's the first service, Sunday morning, 15 minutes before the service, I'm standing in that little Wesley Methodist church behind the pulpit, and I'm looking out the window, and there's not one car anywhere. I mean, nobody. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. We've been telling everybody for all summer, we're starting this church, we're starting this church, you need to come to this church. I was so thankful, like finally somebody pulled up. But you know, I was sitting here Wednesday night, I said to my wife, I said, turn around. Turn around and look at this place. Every inch of this space is filled. Double rows across the back, chairs across there. Narthex filled, room filled. And here's what I said. Look what God has done. Amen. It's amazing to me. I'm, I'm just, I'm telling you, it's just amazing. Yes, it's amazing, it's amazing, amazing that I get to see God work. Yes. I sat in here, I, just before the service, I went to the back and Matt and his buddy Rob were sitting and Matt was behind the sound booth. I said, you can't see back here. You need to get down where the action is. No, I can see. I can see. No, no, no. You need to be able to see. So I'm sitting here, and we had the service, and we had the, the Billy Kelly video with his testimony. And I look over, and Matt and his buddy Rob are sitting over there, front row. Brought them right down to the front row. They went from the back to the front. The last you'll be first. And I looked at his friend, Rob, and here's what the Lord said. Go join thyself to that chariot. Anybody know what that means, Acts chapter 8? The Ethiopian eunuch. And I looked at him, I thought, I need to go over and talk to him, and I don't want to walk across here in front of everybody, all these people. And the Lord wouldn't let me off that. And I went over and I said to Rob, I said, Rob, are you saved? He said, no. I said, Rob, would you like to be saved? Here's what he said. Of course. And I said, well, there's a guy there in a gray suit. Go see him, and he'll tell you how to get saved. And he asked the Lord to save him. You say, what is that? That's being able to see what God's doing. That's, that's like getting in on what God's doing. And if you're not saved, that, that doesn't mean anything to you. You miss, you miss all that. But I'm glad I can see God work. Let me say this. I'm glad that I have God in the good times, but I'm glad that I have God in the hard times. I mentioned this funeral I did yesterday. It was a memorial service. There was a 17-year-old girl. I understand she was living out of her car, and she got in an accident with a drunk driver and was killed. I've known I was going to do this service for about a month, to be honest with you, I've been, I've been dreading it. What, in that situation, what do you say to, those, to that mom and dad? What do you say to those sisters? What do you say to that brother? So I went there into the funeral home, and I met with the family, and I come out, and they're sitting there in the front row. 
and I'm just starting the service, and here comes 10 or 15 bikers in in their colors, and they lined the back of the funeral home. This was yesterday. Very respectful, just stand there, just, and uh, during the message, I preached about having a tender heart that when you go through stuff, it'll make your heart tender. I said, these guys here are big, strong guys, but they have tender hearts. You say, well, how do you know they had tender hearts? Well, they didn't have tender hearts. They wouldn't have came to that funeral. But here's the thing, folks. Listen to me. I don't know how people do it if you don't have God. It's not easy to go through hard times. It's not easy to say goodbye to your people you love. It's not easy. But I thank God. Listen, I thank God. I don't, I, we don't know what's coming. Right? We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't want to know what the at noon holds. But I do know this that no matter what I have to go through, God's going to be there with me. I'm not going to go through it alone. I'm not going to do it on my own. I told these folks yesterday, I said, look, it's good, it's good to have family. Thank God for family. I thank God for my family. It's good to have friends. I thank God for my friends. But at a time like this, you need more than family. You need more than friends. You need faith. You need faith. I'm so thankful for the verse that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Lo, I'm with thee always. Thank God. And then, let me say this. I'm thankful that I have peace in the midst of the storm. I'm thankful that God gives Christians peace. The Bible says in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm glad I have that peace. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us. He, the Lord Jesus, also himself, likewise, took part of the same. The Bible says he became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That through death, notice, he might destroy, destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. When Jesus paid for our sins on the cross and rose from the dead, he destroyed the devil. The devil is a beaten foe. But notice what it says last, next. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death. I don't want to die. I'm not looking forward to dying because I have so much to live for. But I'm not afraid to die. I've been there at the door a couple times. And I hope it's a while before I go back. But we don't have to be afraid of dying. We don't have to be afraid of that. Because God gives us that peace. that lost people never understand. There's people so terrified of COVID. And I'm not minimizing COVID. But there's people so, so terrorized. And so terrorized about getting sick. And and all kind of stuff. We don't, we, God don't want us to live that way. God wants us to have that peace. Amen. Years ago, I saw a painting. I remember this painting, and I could probably go online and probably look it up, and I might do that. But there's this painting, and in this painting, there's a, there's a lake, a body of water, and I don't remember exactly what it was. It was a lake, and there's some mountains there, but it's a very dark painting. There's, there's, it's lightning, and it's storm, and it's rain, and you can see the trees are bending, the wind's blowing. And you have this, this picture of this storm, and then the name of the picture seems so wrong for that painting, but the, the title of the painting is Tranquility. And you look at that picture and you think, where's the tranquility? But then as you look carefully, you notice down in the lower right-hand corner, there's, 
there's this big rock, and it's like you're looking out from the rock. And in that rock, there's a little groove. It's a cleft. And in that little cleft in that rock, there's a little sparrow. And that little sparrow is in that big rock. And just looking out all that storm. And there's the tranquility. Listen, we live in a world of storm. We live in a world of storm, a lifetime of storm. But if you're in the cleft of the rock, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. In Exodus 33, Moses, he's been up on Mount Sinai, the thunder and and the fire and the voice of God. He's watched the Lord open that Red Sea and God's children go across on dry ground. He's been there in Egypt when the death angel come through and he's heard the cries of anguish. And after all that, he says to the Lord, he says, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. And the Lord says, if I showed you my glory, you wouldn't be able to live. Nobody can see my glory and live. But I'll do this for you. I have a place. That's what he says. He says, I have a place. And he says, I'll put you in the cleft of this rock. And I'll put my hand over you. And I'll pass by. And when I pass by, I'll take my hand off and give you a little peek. Peace in the midst of the storm. And then the last thing about being a Christian, I thought I'd mention today. We have heaven to look forward to. We have heaven to look forward to. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and uh, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Hey, heaven is a real place. Heaven's a real place. I talk about these funerals. Vic Cosentino, he's not here. He was at the 8 o'clock service, but he has the funeral home down the street, and I've done so many funerals. I walk out to that cemetery lead that casket out to that grave. I stand next to that casket and I always look down in that hole. Can I tell you something? There's never been one thing in that hole that I wanted. Nothing down there I want. I don't cherish the idea of taking my old body and sticking it in the ground and throwing dirt on it. But you know what else? When I stand there, I think about this. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith, I can see it afar. And my father waits over the way to prepare me a dwelling place there. I'm not looking for the hole in the ground. I'm looking for the hole in the sky.